Well, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm delighted, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm especially delighted since there's a little bit of an odd, older audience, and I'm going to have to take you back quite a bit uh, to explain uh, Syria, because uh, a lot of Syria has to do with the way it grew um, as a country over the last century or so. Uh, and so you can't really understand contemporary Syria unless you really understand uh, what has been going on, uh, why the trouble uh, that developed over the last 50, 60 years or so really has historical roots. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky, as you can see, this is a picture, uh, and they're waving the flags for Mr. Bashar uh, al-Assad, who's the young guy, you know, the young, the present ruler. And, and actually, it's, a, it's an air-conditioned vent that makes the, uh, uh, you know, they didn't pay me extra to have the, the flags waving for, uh, for me. And, uh, and for those of you who had a, cup, a couple of cocktails and you think it's, uh, it's not you, it's actually uh, the thing that's moving. Um, and this was the father, of course, sorry for the picture, it's not that great. This was the old uh, Bashar, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the old father, this is Bashar, this was his father. Um, and uh, al-Assad, um, very uh, strategically in Arabic, actually means the lion. You know, it's a, it's a name he gave to himself, uh, to the family, you know, to kind of project masculinity, uh, which is very, very important, of course, um, in uh, Arab politics. You, you know, the chauvinism and, and masculinity is, is a highly priced commodity. All right, so let me move forward a little bit. And the, the, the talk or, uh, today is about solving uh, Libya. Um, and there's a question mark to it, you know, the impossible mission. And if you want kind of the uh, quick preview, the answer is to the question, uh, yes, it is an impossible mission. Uh, you cannot still, I, I will, toward the end of my talk, come back to what I see as kind of, you know, the future um, of the country. Um, and I think that Syria, um, in its modern, the way that it developed, um, cannot really survive and probably will not, I will argue toward the end again of my presentation, will probably not emerge as the country that we knew it before. Uh, it will probably be broken up, belong to different countries, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll spin out um, some of the scenarios um, of what um, is possible there. And here is, of course, Kik is still waving. Wow, how, how wonderful. Um, yeah. Here is the flag of, um, of um, Syria. For those of you who know a little bit about flags in the Middle East, they're all basically all the same, except for Saudi Arabia and so on. They all have the same, the same uh, colors because they all have a symbolic meaning um, in Arab. Uh, there originally used to be three stars on the uh, flag of Syria. Uh, because, as I'll tell you in a minute, uh, Syria, the modern state of Syria was a, originally a number of different states, um, and three, the three of them dominated, and hence it had three flags, and then when they consolidated the country, it became two flags. I'll have to convey a lot of very arcane information to you about um, Syria, so stay with me. It's, uh, you know, hopefully at the end of, of the talk, you know, you'll say, oh, well, yeah, it all makes sense, or maybe it won't, you know, who knows? <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. All right. So let me start off with, you know, kind of a, a word of um, uh, not caution, but kind of reminding us, uh, you know, uh, as I kind of jocularly introduced um, Syria here, um, that this is truly uh, one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. Um, and if you, if you consider here that uh, Syria um, has roughly 18 million people, that more than 6 million of those have to flee their homes over the last um, seven, eight years, uh, and another 5.6 million um, have uh, fled abroad, it gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of catastrophe that we're talking about uh, in this country. Um, 360,000 people dead so far. Um, of which more than 100,000 um, have been civilians, had absolutely nothing to do with the war. They just happened to be uh, you know, in the wrong place um, at the wrong time. Again, to give you a little bit um, of a background to the conflict um, that um, is going on. And as I mentioned to you, um, to understand Syria is a very, very difficult uh, task. And it's a difficult task because there are a number of kind of interwoven factors 
Um, and I assume this presentation, Liz, will be available to people who want it. Uh, you post it somewhere. So you, know, you, you can always go back to it. Um, but I want to take uh, what I'm going to try to do today um, is take you through all of these um, kind of bullet points here uh, that I have to help you explain um, how Syria um, has emerged. Uh, and as I said, you know, you, you have to understand all of this to understand the modern state um, of Syria. And you may notice that I've put state here in between, you know, brackets. Um, it's because I'm, I'm trained in part as a political scientist. Um, and one of the arguments I will make a little bit later on is that Syria never really emerged um, as a modern state, the way that we think of a state with a modern administration, with, you know, institutions institutions that function uh, at the, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of citizens, uh, you know, that really never happened in Syria. It was a country. It had a flag. It had a capital. Uh, but to function as a country, as a state, the way a state should, it never, never really did is one of the arguments that I'll make a little bit later on. And in order to help you explain that, um, I'll first of all have to tell you a little bit how um, Syria emerged. Um, first of all, uh, you are probably all aware that every single country in the Middle East, except for one or two exceptions, but that, let's say, all countries in the Middle East um, are artificial creations. If you were to go back 150 years, there were no countries in the Middle East. There were no states. You know, you could go to the Arab Gulf and, you know, you would have a territory that was controlled by tribes. Uh, you went to Syria, um, and if you were to ask somebody 150 years ago, uh, you know, where are you from? Uh, now, today, you know, they may say, you know, I'm from Syria, although they probably wouldn't say that either. They would probably tell you that if you talk to a Syrian and you say to a Syrian, where are you from? He may say, I'm from Damascus or I'm from Aleppo or I'm Kurdish, you know, a different uh, part ethnic group within, within Syria. Again, indicating that this is not a completely formed state. Um, and so I'll need to tell you a little bit about that and how that has an impact. Uh, you know, we as Americans, uh, you know, when we, you know, when, when they ask you, what are you, you know, and uh, you're in a foreign country, somebody says, what, what are you? You say, hey, you know, I'm American, right? I'm from the U.S., uh, you know, unless, of course, you're very chauvinistic and, you know, you say I'm from Cincinnati or something. Over <laughs> yeah, no, no, you know, you usually say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen, right? Uh, a lot of, again, uh, in, in the Middle East, that is a highly suspect thing, and a lot of people will not identify necessarily, you know, with the country that they come from, and, and that will have an impact that I'll talk about a little bit later on. I'll talk about the colonial legacy because, again, um, countries were artificially created. Uh, as I mentioned a second ago, they were created by the colonial powers. If you've ever seen a map um, of the Middle East and you've ever wondered why Jordan, the country Jordan, on the eastern side is, you know, has a straight line. I mean, it, you know, it, it's as straight as it can be for hundreds of miles. If you're wondering why that is, it's because Churchill, on a Sunday afternoon in 1916, put a ruler down on a map and said, this is the border of Jordan. Right? So again, very, very artificial. Now, if you were a tribe living to the west of that line or a tribe living to the east of that line and from the same tribe, you didn't belong together anymore suddenly. And again, that had a major impact. And I'll tell you a little bit why the same kind of phenomenon happened um, in Syria uh, as well. So that's the colonial legacy. Um, I'll obviously will have to talk a little bit uh, about religion. Uh, you know, um, virtually um, all Syrians um, are Muslims. Um, but there are different uh, uh, denomina or, or groups, I should say, uh, within Muslims, very, very important uh, for what happens um, to the country. As a matter of fact, it's really been one of the determinative effects um, of why Syria has not cohered together very logically as a group. There are the Sunnis. And the Sunnis are the largest group in Syria, roughly 80%. Um, and when I say roughly, I do so because, uh, you know, remember that Syria has been uh, a dictatorship for a very long time. Um, they have not really held census, uh, you know, uh, deliberately because they don't really want to know, you know, how many Sunnis there are and how many Shiites there are. That's, of course, the other group. Um, and the Shiites are by far the minority. They're roughly about 10 to 12 percent. It's estimated. But... The, the, the group that has led the country uh, belongs to um, the Shiite group, although it's a runaway sect from, uh, from the Shiites. It's not even accepted by most Sunnis um, as being Islamic, um, and that um, is the Alawites. And so Basad, uh, Bashir Basad, the current lure, is an, is an Alawite. And the Alawites have uh, 
dominated politics, the economy, everything um, in Syria um, for at least since 1970 uh, when, and, and a little bit before when his father um, came to power. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very awkward situation. You have a minority in charge, but the minority controls the army, controls the security services, which are very, very important um, in, in Syria. You know, it has multiple layers um, of security to guarantee that the Assad family essentially stay, and, and the friends of the Assad family um, essentially um, stay in power. So I'll t say a little bit about that, the role of religion. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Arab socialism, Arab unity, Arab nationalism. Not so much about communism because there's, there's very few communists in, uh, in, in uh, Syria. Um, but um, Syria, as many Arab countries, went through um, a prolonged period, you know, coming out of the colonial period when the country became independent in 1946. You know, um, as most countries that became independent, you saw the same debate in India, you know, in China, wherever you were. You know, some of the questions that people ask, you know, what do we do? You know, where do we go from here? Um, what do we want our economy to look like? Uh, you know, now that the colonial masters uh, were gone, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with all these different groups that we have? Um, and um, at that time, in the 1940s and the 1950s, there were a number of local Syrians, intellectuals, professors like me, um, who started thinking about these questions and uh, developed their own ideology that became known um, as Arab nationalism nationalism or Arab socialism. And I'll tell you a word about that because, again, it influenced the way that Syrians even today think about, you know, what their country should look like. Even in 2011, a lot of the uprising, a lot of the younger people were chanting the same kind of slogans that the Arab nationalists were uh, sloganing in the 1950s and the 1960s. So there's, you know, there's the kind of, a, we, we know, a lot of times we don't tend to think that ideas have power, but they're very, very powerful in a way. And I, again, Syria is also a very good example where these old ideas about Arab nationalism and so on have been carried forward, uh, you know, and really carried the day until today to some extent. All the notions of um, equality, equity, and so on, uh, that that uh, were uh, chanted uh, in the uprising in 2011 they really hark back to these days of Arab nationalism. And so I'll talk about um, that as well. A little bit about the economic development because one of the things that has been uh, a, a real problem in Libya is that this very tiny minority, the Alawites, have economically controlled the country as well and have used the resources of the country to kind of strategically divide and rule the country, you know, the way dictators normally um, tend to do. So I'll say a word about that as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about toward the end uh, about why I think that um, Syria is not really a modern state. The way, again, as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, is not even a modern nation. They don't think of themselves um, as a nation in many ways. They think of themselves as Kurds. They think of themselves as Sunnis. Uh, they may think of themselves as belonging to a certain province. But again, the concept of a, a united Syria is still very much uh, kind of a, a suspect concept until today um, in Syria. Um, and then. Uh, not so surprisingly, uh, because we are talking about the Middle East, um, I'll have to talk about outside forces. Um, as you know, most of the countries in the Middle East, for one reason or another, um, became pawns in the, uh, the play between the superpowers after World War II, in particular, during the Cold War. Um, and Syria escaped that a little bit uh, because it didn't have any resources, really. Uh, you know, if you were a country, let's say, like Saudi Arabia um, or Libya, uh, you know, that I've written about extensively, you, you know, you, you had to kind of lean one way or the other in the Cold War. You had no choice. Uh, you know, and the superpowers made that very clear. Syria was not in, in quite the same situation because it didn't really have uh, money that, you know, and oil that either the Soviet Union or the United States were after. But nevertheless, we'll see in the 1970s, it did assume a little bit of a strategic importance. Um, and then it leaned um, actually toward communism. It leaned to the, toward the Soviet Union, uh, but never became really a communist state, even though, as we'll see when I talk about um, the, the kind of the background, the ideological background, a lot of the ideas about communism infiltrated what I'll talk about in a minute, um, Arab um, socialism. Um, and so I'll, I'll then, then finish uh, you know, with kind of saying, uh, talking very, very briefly about um, uh, 2011, you know, and the uprising that you're probably most familiar with, you know, the Arab Spring um, and what happened during the Arab Spring. 
um, and why um, here we are, you know, um, eight years um, after the Arab Spring, I've just told you how many people um, have been killed, um, that eight years later, um, in a sense, there really is still no solution in sight um, for Libya. Well, there is a solution, um, actually, and, and why, as I said, you can answer that question positively that I posed um, as the title to the talk, um, and that is um, that, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, it, it, it looks um, as if the Assad regime, you know, the, uh, the Basar al-Assad uh, and the Alawites um, will win the civil war. Uh, and, you know, despite the fact that they have you know, then been the major perpetrators of all the killings that have gone on, the torturing, which is legion all over um, Syria, you know, a lot of, uh, or at least a bunch of American journalists ended up in some of these torture jails and were killed eventually, et cetera, et cetera. It looks as if in part because of the connections that the Syrians have to the international community, particularly to Russia, um, that eventually the war, the civil war, will die down, uh, but uh, the Assad government will very much um, remain in place. So uh, again, you know, it's a, and I apologize, it's a, a rather a negative, uh, very pessimistic appraisal um, of what is happening um, in uh, Syria. So let me start off, first of all, I'm taking you back a little bit in history. Uh, again, delighted to see it's a little bit of an older audience when, you know, when I project this map in my uh, intro class uh, at Dartmouth uh, for my students, you know, they look at it as if, you know, something from Mars or something. <laughs> so I, I hope at least, at least you've all heard of the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, which is kind of the precursor, you know, of, of the modern Middle East. And this really is what the empire looked like um, at its uh, high point in uh, 1566. 1566, uh, incidentally, is the period of Suleiman the Magnificent that, you know, some of you uh, may have heard of. Um, and as you can see, this was a kind of a multi-ethnic, multi multinational um, empire and the area that we're really concerned with is this little area here Syria is right here you know this is the Arabian uh, Peninsula and as you can see um, Egypt of course was very much part of the you know, one of the one of the big parts um, of um, the Ottoman Empire and then of course uh, Turkey uh, what what eventually you know became um, Turkey um, and so you may remember that the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century um, had declined um, over a long period of time uh, really the, the high point was Suleiman the Magnificent in 1566, um, and the Ottoman Empire was routinely referred to, sorry, in the 19th century as the sick man of Europe. You may remember this, right? So after World War I, um, the empire um, gets divided. Uh, and of course, you know, the question that I'm interested in is, you know, what happens to countries like, you know, areas um, like Syria that are in here, you know, areas like Egypt. The only, the only country, incidentally, at the time that really had the name, a modern name that kind of carried it forward, um, was Egypt. Um, at the time, you didn't refer to Syria as Syria. Syria is a kind of a name that came much, much later. Um, they had very specific Turkish names. For example, the area around Damascus would be called the Sanjak of Damascus. Um, so again, you know, the, the notion of a modern country um, did not really um, exist. Um, and so um, after World War I, um, when the Ottoman Empire um, really collapsed, the Turks had been on the wrong side of the fence, so to speak, during World War I. Um, you know, the, the powers met uh, the great powers, that is, Great Britain, France, um, Russia, although Russia was a little bit on the sidelines, he had had, had a, its own revolution in 1917, uh, the United States, Great Britain, um, and they all met um, in Paris. Um, in 1919 and 1920 um, for something I'm sure you remember, uh, you know, the Paris Peace Conference. Um, and at the Paris Peace Conference, the big question was, or one of the big questions was, what do we do with the remnants um, of the Ottoman Empire? Um, and so I want to move forward a little bit. As all of this was taking place, you know, as they were meeting in, in Paris, there actually um, had been a secret agreement. You remember, this is that, you know, the, the period of, of colonialism. A lot of the, the agreements were secret. There was a secret agreement that had been signed in 1916 and um, that actually had already divided up the area among several allies, particularly the French and the British. And the agreement was known um, as the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. You've probably heard it because when ISIS invaded, um, when ISIS invaded uh, about uh, eight years ago in Syria, um, they brought up the Sykes-Picot Agreement and argued they would destroy the remnants of, you know, whatever was left of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. But more important for our purposes here tonight, 
is that you can see uh, what is happening. Um, these areas were all assigned to different uh, countries. The area that you're looking at here, where Syria is, and, and the dark blue uh, was assigned to, to France. Um, and then uh, Britain, of course, uh, got Iraq you know, and went all the way into the Gulf. Um, uh, Great Britain was very interested in the Gulf uh, because Great Britain, you may remember, was already switching from coal-fired ships um, to oil uh, ships, oil-driven ships, and so they needed oil. Um, from, and they also needed Aden in what is today Yemen because they needed as a as a depot um, for their harbor. And anyway, so this was how um, the region um, had been secretly divided even before uh, the peace conference of 1920. What this hints at, of course, is that uh, the colonial powers, France and Britain, um, already were determined to divide the area according to their own wishes, irrespective um, of what that 1920 peace conference uh, decided. And you may also remember that, in part, the war against Turkey uh, and the remnant, uh, kind of the rump of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East um, had been won uh, by uh, Great Britain and by France, in part with the help of the Arabs. Uh, you know, you may remember, you all seen Lawrence of Arabia, right? You know, the, the, the British guy who, who goes, helps the local tribes to, uh, you know, re rebel against the Turks. You know, all of this. So there had been all kinds of agreements, very famous agreements that I won't bore you with, uh, you know, about um, after the war was done, that the Arabs uh, would get independence, you know, that they would be able to create their own independent countries. Um, and so at the Paris Peace Conference, um, there was one man, and you see him here in the middle, um, Faisal, um, of the Hashemite family, um, who indeed had been promised uh, by Sharif Hussein, uh, sorry, by uh, uh, Weiss, uh, by um, the colonial office in, in London, um, that he that his territory uh, would become that the Arab, you know, the Arab lands uh, would become uh, independent. Um, and um, he went to the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, any, rec anybody recognize anybody at all on this picture? Yeah, yeah Lawrence of Arabia, of course, is standing right here, right? Um, and so Lawrence was involved. Lawrence was very much on the side of the Arabs, wanted to give them independence. Anyway, so Faisal, you can see this is a it's, a, it's a really, really sad picture. This picture was just taken after he had been told, essentially, um, that, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the victorious um, allies would not give him independence for his countries. He walked down the steps and they took the picture. You know, very, very, very sad. Uh, but I show, wanted to show you the next picture as well, um, and that is of Faisal again. Um, but just to give you an idea, uh, you know, kind of a historical idea of what we're talking about here, these were still, you know, very much tribal societies in a way. You, you know, you look at these people, you know, this, you know, this is tribal in a sense. These were not, you know, modern citizens in a sense of a state. And so to them, even the notion of a state really a modern state was was very very uh, very weird as a matter of fact in arabic they have no word for a secular king i mean they didn't at the time um, and so somebody like um, sharif would normally have been referred to um, as the sultan sultan and sultan is simply sulta in arabic uh, means uh, power he who holds the power basically now when they created these newly independent countries the french and the british they had to come up with a new word uh, a secular word for the same you know sultan um, and so uh, the kings afterwards were referred to as malik uh, you know and you'll see this name from time to time still uh, being used you know malik yes no, I don't. Um, no, I, it, it's one. It's somebody. Uh, I, mm, I. It could be. I don't know. I just don't know. It's a good question. It certainly looks like a Westerner, doesn't? It? I mean, this guy I know. This is for, He is from the. He was from the legation in Iraq um, at the time. Had been transferred for the for the conference. It could be, um, Lord. Although, I kind of. This is really minutia. I doubt it because of the headgear. Um, he, uh, Lawrence would not have worn that headgear. If you look back at the other picture, you see the headgear. This is more the Transjordan headgear that he would have worn. Anyway, real, real detail for specialists um, here. Right. So anyway, so you know the conference is done, um, and uh, you know the Arabs, of course, are very disillusioned. Uh, you know the, the, they don't get their territory. Syria becomes part of France, so to speak, a French territory, um, and all of this. You you know, to kind of uh, emphasize the hypocrisy a little bit, uh, was at the time, of course, when our very president, Woodrow Wilson, uh, you know, was arguing for the creation of the League of Nations that would give these countries their independence.
independence, uh, to do away with all these secret agreements of which the Sykes-Picot um, had been a very good example. Uh, you may remember that part of the 14 points that uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, enunciated was, and I've put it here, open covenants openly arrived at. In other words, let's do away with the secret diplomacy you know, that the, the British and the French have been doing for so long, of which Sykes-Picot uh, and what happened at the Paris Peace Conference was a very good example. You know, look, un unfortunately, as you know, uh, Wilson didn't carry the day. He couldn't even get the League of Nations approved by the US Congress. We went kind of in, into isolation isolation in the interwar period. Um, and so, in a sense, the Syrians were uh, by themselves. Uh, and they were under French tutelage. And so until World War II, and I'll try to kind of summarize this uh, very briefly, uh, but until uh, World War II, um, Syria remained a French mandate. Uh, roughly, uh, they, were, they gave them a little bit of independence, um, but uh, the man who they had appointed as king of Syria, the man whose picture you just saw, Faisal, um, was removed after 1923, um, after a famous battle that was really an uprising in part against the French, and to punish him, they pushed him out um, as king. He fled, or he went, I should say, um, to the only territory that was available at the time still that didn't really have a king. He went to Transjordan, um, where the current king is, of course, the great grandson of Hussein. You know, that's the Hashemite uh, line. Uh, so again, uh, you know, all, all done kind of uh, through the auspices of the British um, and um, the French. Um, and uh, I should also say, I'll show that a little bit later on, um, when Syria was originally created, um, it included what today we call Lebanon. Uh, you know, the country Lebanon is now, of course, an independent country, but it didn't become independent until actually quite, quite a bit later. And it was originally part um, of Syria. And so you may also remember um, that Assad the Elder um, at one point made a big point uh, when they invaded Lebanon um, during the Civil War in the 1970s. Uh, you know, he said that um, uh, Lebanon uh, was part of greater Syria. Uh, and so that, therefore, there were the legitimate, uh, legitimate army um, inside Lebanon. Of course, there was really nothing to it. All the international agreements had already been signed. But it's not until 2008, uh, to give you kind of a sense of how important history is to this region, it's not until 2008 that Syria actually recognizes the independence um, of Lebanon. Right? And I'll come back to that um, a little bit um, later on. Um, so what France did in the, inter in the period until World War II, you know, from the time they got it, it assigned it as a mandate, Syria assigned as a mandate until World War II, was really a very classic divide and rule policy. You know, you play off one group against the other. And the way you did that in Syria um, is by playing off this minority, the Alawites, against the rest of the country. You gave the Alawites certain privileges, you know, that made them important, that started to make them able to dominate the country, in a sense, at the expense of other groups that the French were afraid of could eventually rise up against them. So again, it's uh, called a very classic divide and rule policy. And as a result of that, the group that came to dominate um, Syrian politics, the Alawites, find their origin going all the way back to what the French did um, in the interwar period. So again, you know, history here is very, very important to understand uh, why what has happened in Syria has happened, but also when we speculate a little bit later on about the future, why you, you will understand it's so difficult to consider of any solution because a lot of these political systems are so ingrained in a sense, so barnacled uh, with all this history, you know, that it's very, very difficult to really um, reform them. And again, I'll come back to that um, a little bit um, later on. And so here was uh, the Syrian mandate. Then very quickly, as I said, it was eventually it consisted of a number of different states: uh, the state of Damascus, state of Aleppo, the big, you know, the two the two big heavyweight cities. Um, in uh, Aleppo, anybody ever been in Aleppo by by any chance? Yeah, you know, beautiful, just an absolutely you know amazing, amazing place. Uh, you know, one of the heads of the caliphates at one point, totally destroyed almost at this point because of the bombing. Uh, you know, as much as much of Syria is, um, incidentally. Um, uh, state of Damascus, and then um, you can see here Greater Lebanon, you know what became Lebanon, eventually the state of Lebanon, the country of Lebanon. Oops. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but um, it, it shows you already what I'll, 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 I need to uh, talk to you about in, in somewhat greater detail. Uh, the different groups you see here, the Jabal al-Druz, right? 
um, and the Druze are a very different um, group um, within uh, Islam. Uh, they are also considered the heretics uh, by most um, Islamists, by, by most Muslims, um, but nevertheless a very, very powerful group um, in, in uh, Syria and particularly also um, in uh, Lebanon, you know, and there's lots of affinity between the two groups uh, in, in Syria um, and in, in Lebanon. And you can see here this purple part uh, and it says very clearly the Alawite state. You know, this was the area that the Alawites, who eventually assumed control, that remain in control until today, this is where they came from. This was their territory, um, in a sense, right? Um, so it gives you a very good idea um, of kind of the, the ge geographical dispersal um, of these groups um, during the time um, of the mandate. I'll show you a map toward the end. Uh, Syria looks quite a bit different now, but nevertheless, these particular parts, the Latakia and this area around, is still the stronghold um, of, the of the Bashar al-Assad uh, regime until um, today, um, although a lot of it um, has now been occupied by uh, government forces uh, as well. Um, so that's kind of a very, very quick um, overview. Uh, and again, here I wanted to show you very quickly the, the, the areas, the Alawites, the minority, the Sunni, um, and the Kurd. Uh, and again, if you kind of keep this, mind in, uh, your, this map in your mind a little bit, um, toward the end, uh, when I show you another map, you'll see how um, this um, has really changed um, quite, uh, quite uh, dramatically. But again, the only thing that hasn't changed is really the area around Latakia. Yes? Were there other Shia? sects in Syria? You, yes. You know, I know that the Alawites were, but you mm -hmm. said that they were sort of a minority. Of yes, them. there is also what is called the, the Shi'i Fiver sect and the Twelver sect. But they're not represented on this particular... No, no, they're, they're very, very tiny. They're not, they, don't even, they don't really count. So the Alawites were the majority Shia then? Uh, majority Shia, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. but but again, remember that you know the Shia themselves are only 10 to 12 percent of the overall uh, population. All right, so that's kind of you know the the, the map you know with the, with the different uh, and so let me move on and then very quickly kind of encapsulate if I could what happened after the war and again to you know give you an update kind of on on the historical development here um, and uh, if I could kind of encapsulate this myself in in a few words rather than take you um, through all of this what you really saw in Syria between 1948 um, and uh, let's say here 1963 um, is a period of intense uh, political instability. Uh, again, the country is trying to look, uh, you know, how it's going to constitute itself. Uh, it doesn't really have a lot of state institutions to deal with. These different groups are all vying for different kind of uh, powers, uh, you know, how the, how the country, how the, the offices of the country, etc., will be um, split up. Um, and um, it's really within this, of course, that the Cold War takes place. And as I said, the Cold War didn't really affect um, uh, Syria too much, overly much, in part, again, because um, it had no resources, uh, but nevertheless um, the Soviets were able to convince um, the Syrians that it might be in their interest to kind of lean, uh, you know, toward uh, the Soviet Union, and, and at one point there, there is one uh, deep harbor off the coast of Syria that is of particular interest to any superpower, um, and uh, the, the uh, Soviets uh, managed um, to gain a lease um, on that harbor um, for a while. But this was not um, really uh, terribly important. The United States didn't um, over worry at the time yet uh, about Syria in part because you know overall it was relatively uh, unimportant uh, but it was highly highly unstable it attempted uh, unification with Egypt in 1958 and I'll come back to that in a minute uh, because that brings us you know to uh, an even much more important person than, than Bashir al-Assad um, in, in the region um, and so essentially um, uh, you know uh, instability uh, and I want to say a word now about about kind of, you know, if, if overall there was a lot of instability driven by all the factors that I've mentioned, um, a lot of the instability was also driven by the fact um, that um, this was, as I hinted at a few minutes ago, this was really a period in the Middle East where there was uh, an enormous amount of political upheaval that was sparked, um, in part because people were trying to find a kind of direction for the country. Um, and so, you know, th there were a number of models that you could think of, you know, you could pursue capitalism, um, of course, uh, or you could pursue uh, communism. Uh, you know, under the Soviet Union, um, but most Arab countries um, were not enamored either um, of capitalism or um, of uh, communism too much, um, and they kind of developed, kind of in, in a native sense, much like they did in Cuba with, with Guevara and so on. They, they developed their own kind of um, philosophy. 
a very, very, very powerful native philosophy that influenced and continues to influence today, you know, how people in Syria think about what the future of the country could be. Um, and it became known here, as I, as I put it, Arab nationalism, sometimes all called um, Arab socialism. Um, and it was led by two men. Uh, that uh, to you perhaps don't mean much, but certainly for an academic by, like myself and you know somebody who's interested in kind of uh, ideas uh, and the impact of ideas on history. Uh, the first one was uh, Michel Aflac, uh, and the second one um, was um, Salah al Din al-Bitar. Um, and uh, to go back very quickly to Michel Aflac, um, very interestingly enough, something that happens in, in virtually all colonial situations, you'll notice that his first name is, is Michel, is a Catholic name, is a, is a Christian name, uh, you know, and very interestingly enough, what happened in every colonial uh, country, a lot of the intellectual elite was trained in local schools run by the, either the French or the British, and so, you know, Aflac really comes out of, and, and most of the Arab nationalists actually come out of French schools uh, in, in this case. You know, they all studied, Aflac studied in Paris, then went back to Damascus, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of a, a very interesting uh, development. And of course, a lot of the ideas that they developed about socialism and so on really found their origin um, in Western European thinking going all the way back um, to Karl Marx. And so both Aflaq um, and um, Salah Hadin al-Bitar uh, were kind of the, the, the most important. There were a number of other ones, but the most important ones um, in Syria. Um, and of course, um, the reason in a sense that they became important is, first of all, because they had kind of a native standing. You know, they were seen as intellectuals uh, within their society and respected um, um, for that within their societies. But they also had a really, really powerful protector uh, in the Arab world that also believed in those very same ideas um, of Arab nationalism and Arab socialism. Um, and that, of course, was Gamal Abdel Nasser, right? And Gamal Abdel Nasser, you know, became this kind, this kind of superhero, you know, for most um, Arabs. Uh, you know, wrote this wonderful little uh, booklet. If you know, if you ever uh, find yourself uh, lost for something to read, read Nasser's little booklet. It's called Philosophy of the Revolution, uh, in which he kind of, you know, laid out what his political program was, and why. Here was the big question, you know, why is it that the Arabs? who had this magnificent civilization, you know, five, six hundred years ago, you know, think to the Alhambra, you know, think to cities like Damascus, like Aleppo, uh, you, know, what, you know, a brilliant civilization, particularly under Suleiman the Magnificent, et cetera, et cetera. You know, why is it that that civilization kind of crumbled? Why did the Arabs find themselves in this kind of sorry state that Syria, for example, did, you know, uh, being a mandate from some European country, not even been able to run its own affairs. Um, and so what Aflaq and Bitar were trying to do, and, and certainly Nasser in, in that little booklet, was try to instill um, in the Arabs a sense of pride to really build up their countries again, uh, to really create unity. And, and, and they saw particularly unity among Arabs um, as very, very important. Um, and hence why uh, Nasser created all these unions with the United Arab, Arab, uh, Arab, Arab Emirates, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all to try to kind of uh, you know, strengthen um, the position of the Arabs in the world. By the way, you know, this is something that continues until today, right? I mean, if you, if you ever read anything about ISIS uh, and the contemporary radical Islamist movements, you know, they say exactly the same thing, right? They're trying to kind of unify Muslims and they're trying to kind of bring them back, you know, to that point that they were five, six centuries ago when the caliphate existed, right? So, it's, you know, again, you know, there's a, there's a really a continuum here, you know, that goes all the way back several centuries. And so there, you know, of course, Nasser um, was uh, the big man uh, in all of this, uh, inspired uh, not only Bitar and, and Salah ad uh, but also um, uh, inspired, of course, somebody that I've talked to you about here before, uh, Gaddafi in, in Libya um, and others, uh, you know, people who really kind of um, shared this idea about the greatness of the Arab nation um, that, that should come back again after having been lost um, for um, so long. Um, of course, uh, you know, in, in, in a sense, the man who then came to dominate and, and coming out of this Arab socialist period um, was uh, the first uh, real president, uh, so to speak, um, of Syria, um, Hafez al-Assad. And you know, you're 
all of the right age to, of course, to have known Hafez al-Assad uh, very well uh, when he was president, uh, emerged as very interestingly enough also, uh, you know, a lot of times people ask me, um, why is it that in the Middle East, um, or it's not just the Middle East, why is it that all over the world actually, you know, military regimes seem to the, be the ones, you know, that take power and are able to, you know, or push their countries forward, not always very well. But uh, the, the reason for that is, of course, is that um, kind of as a deliberate policy during the colonial period, uh, the colonial powers made sure um, that, you know, grew, that people could not affiliate themselves in, in groups. You couldn't have labor unions, for example, because they were scared, you know, that they were going to stand up against the French, which eventually, of course, happened anyway in Tunisia, Algeria, and so on. But the only group that really developed a kind of um, technical expertise and solidarity among themselves to really become a powerful pressure group um, was the military um, in the Middle East. And hence why in, in many Arab countries you find that the military you know, really led these coups uh, you know, that eventually um, then led to independence or, uh, you know, or after independence. Um, and so here was um, Hafez al-Assad um, climbed up through the ranks again. Uh, remember, he is an Alawite, uh, you know, so in principle, you know, even though the Alawites were, uh, you know, a protected or, or a privileged minority, in principle, he shouldn't really have risen so far, but he was a very ruthless uh, man, um, you know, read the tea leaves very well uh, within the Syrian army, um, was appointed minister of defense, um, and then in a slide I'll show in a minute, you know, became uh, president, appointed himself president, another coup. Um, and I think Syria, if, if you look at the period from 1946 um, to 1970, when the last major coup occurred, um, I think Syria had something like 17 military coups. Uh, I mean, you know, very highly, highly unstable, right? Yeah. So, uh, but of course, um, he emerged um, as uh, the leader. Um, Hafez al-Assad, very ruthless, um, as you know, uh, you know, highly, highly authoritarian, um, used these teachings um, that Michel Aflac. Uh, and his uh, cohorts had written about Arab socialism um, in a political movement that became known as the Ba'ath. And you probably all heard about the Ba'ath party in Syria and then in Iraq. Ba'ath in um, Arabic means renaissance. Uh, you know, uh, again, to go back to the ideas, of course, you know, that they want to, they want the Arab nation to be reborn in a sense, that they want there to be um, a renaissance, hence the Ba'ath party. And this Ba'ath party, um, which of course persists until today, was really the party that Bashar and Hafez, his father, um, used to keep themselves in power and to run Syria with an iron fist, re again, literally until um, today. Um, and so here's very quickly then his career, if you wanted to. The Ba'ath emerges in Syria in 1963. Um, and 1970 um, is really, you know, when Hafez al-Assad comes to power, when he assumes power, um, so to speak, uh, where the Ba'ath party now becomes the ideological party, much like the Communist Party um, in the Soviet Union. You couldn't have any other alternative parties. I mean, you could for, you know, for, for propaganda purposes, but they couldn't really mean um, anything at all. Um, and and at the same time, as soon as he came to power, um, he created a new constitution, uh, you know, to make sure that he could stay in power for a long time. Uh, there was a, a kind of a, a little, a little strange thing to it. Um, they, um, the, one of the stipulations that um, al-Assad um, had in that constitution that anybody um, who wanted to become president um, of Syria had to be at least 40 years old. And lo and behold, when he dies, his son is only 34. Uh, you know, and so they had to adjust, adjust the, the constitution literally overnight <laughs> to make it happen. You know, only in Syria. Right? Well, I shouldn't say that. Only in, in highly authoritarian <laughs> countries. Right? Anyway, we'll, we'll come to Bashar um, in, in a minute. Um, and so again, this is kind of very quickly history, you know, the, the involvements of, of uh, Syria. Um, and the one thing I wanted to point at here, because it's going to become so important and remains so important, uh, both for what is happening in Syria, but also for what will potentially um, happen in Syria, is really the rise of the Muslim brother Brotherhood. The rise of the Muslim Brotherhood is important because the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood is antithetical to the Arab socialism and Arab nationalism that Aflaq and the Ba'ath party, which is a secular ideology, uh, you know, or um, uh, youth. Religion 
Um, and, and as you know, I'm not telling you anything new here, you know, but religion uh, in the Middle East, as in most countries, is always used for instrumental purposes. You know, they may not, you know, the people themselves, uh, people like uh, the Yassats, for example, are not religious at all, you know, but they use religion, uh, you know, or reliance or adherence, so-called adherence to religion to create some kind um, of political allegiance for what it holds. It always reminds me of this joke of, uh, you know, when uh, you may remember that uh, Napoleon, uh, uh, Napoleon asked the Pope to uh, to crown him as emperor and the Pope said but I don't understand uh, you don't believe in God do you or you don't believe in the Pope and Napoleon responds no but I believe in his battalions All right so uh, again you know the very practical aspect of religion the same thing here uh, very much in, in, in Syria you know, Islam is really used instrumentally for what you can achieve um, rather uh, for what it is itself but the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood becomes very important because a a little bit later on um, in uh, Syria's history in 1982 and as I put it here this was really the turning point um, for modern um, Syrian politics in 1982 um, in a city called Hama uh, there were protests that were um, inspired by for the, 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 the real the first real big protest against the Assad regime um, that were sponsored by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and uh, Hama I, I drove through Hama a couple of years after um, it actually happened and the city was still completely flat I mean literally I mean flat that wasn't a building that stood up in, in Hama they it, they flattened it completely and they uh, killed an estimated 20,000 people. They, I mean, probably much more than that. Nobody, I mean, you couldn't even write about it. The journalists couldn't even mention um, Hama in their articles. You know, again, a, var, a very highly authoritarian. See. But it really is the turning point um, for the regime because um, even though it's a very, very violent put down um, of that phenomenon, you know, it also marks the beginning of people starting to question. Uh, particularly the role um, that um, the Alawites are playing in Syrian politics and, and the use of religion um, for the purposes um, of, the, of the Alawites, which again, you know, we're seeing um, as um, a, a, a breakaway sect um, of Shia Islam. And as a matter of fact, to kind of try to get over it, um, uh, Assad um, included in the constitution um, a, a stipulation that the president of the republic always had to be a Muslim. Uh, you know, because there are Christians after all also. And, uh, and that was incredibly controversial uh, and, and sparked, uh, you know, in part the unrest that led to 1982, in part because, of course, he was seen um, as, a, as a Kafir in a sense, as a non-believer because he was an Alawite, uh, you know, belonging to the sect that um, Sunnis do not recognize as belonging to um, Islam. So really a turning point here. Um, uh, um, Hafez al-Assad dies in 19, uh, 2002. It's succeeded, of course, by Assad. Um, as I told you, they had to stay, uh, you know, change the constitution overnight um, and then, uh, you know, is elected as president, uh, you know, typical, of course, you, you know, it reminds you of the Soviet Union, right? Uh, you know, elected with 97.29% um, of the vote. I think whatever the 2% were lost in the wind or something, you know, they just, they just didn't count them. Uh, again, you know, gives you a very good idea what's going on, right? You're talking about a dictatorship here, uh, but a dictatorship that, you know, by known is known for um, its cruelty essentially um, worldwide um, and then you know uh, the kind of things proceed after 2000 uh, uh, and here is of course the young man uh, Bashar al-Assad um, very interestingly enough Bashar was uh, trained in the West um, as an ophthalmologist um, and when was was called back um, you know and uh, uh, to, to you know take over from his father um, and the expectation was uh, when he took you know because he had this Western education and so on the the, the expectation was that um, they you, that in Syria would we would see kind of an early dawning of you know of the Arab Spring so to speak you know that he would bring um, all kinds um, of reforms um, to the country and you know, he started off actually quite well. He made all the kind of right noises um, initially, um, and he had this, what was called the Damascus Spring Debate of July 2000, you know, where they debated democracy, uh, you know, and input from the people and reforming the economy. I mean, you know, just, uh, you know, the, uh, let a hundred flowers, you know, according, you know, the, the, the old Mao saying, uh, bloom here. Um, and so everybody thought, oh, wow, you know, this kind of rusted down political system, you know, the old Assad is gone, you know, uh, Syria is going to become kind of a responsible player um, within the region, uh, you know, hallelujah, right? 
Um, and then, of course, literally within uh, a few months, by the end of uh, August 2001, about a year later or so, all of the intellectuals that had been part, all the journalists that had been part of this Damascus Spring um, had been incarcerated or had been forced to leave the country. So, you know, it was back to, you know, business as usual run by the Alawites, um, essentially. But it's really, again, uh, together with Hama, uh, a kind of a turning point. Uh, you know, once, you know, once you've seen Paris, how, you know, you know the expression, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, people, uh, you raise these kinds of expectations, I guess, as I see, I said earlier, ideas are important in, in many ways. Uh, and so the idea that uh, there is some kind of liberalization uh, necessary uh, becomes kind of a guiding idea that infiltrates the debate in, in Syria very, very quiet, of course, because you cannot say it publicly, but certainly that you start to see um, outside Libya and some of the, uh, sorry, outside Syria and um, some of the, the papers, the newspapers, the, you know, the magazines and so on that are being published by expats, you know, that have left the country. So again, also um, very important uh, for what happened. Um, and this is um, kind of married, in, in a sense, to something we had not, not really seen either before, um, and that is unrest uh, among some of the ethnic minorities um, in um, Syria. And of course, the one in particular that I'm referring to um, are the Kurds. Uh, you may remember, uh, or, or for those of you who are not familiar, the Kurds are a very distinct ethnic group that are spread over five different countries, including Iran, uh, Turkey, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, it's really at this point that the Kurds also start formulating um, their own uh, kind of political platforms. And the Kurds, of course, once 2011 comes, will weigh in, will start fighting um, against um, the um, regime. Um, the, the civil war then itself um, that started in 2011 um, started um, after the arrest um, of 15 school children in a town called Dera um, in um, Syria. Um, a, a particularly ugly um, episode in, in uh, Syrian history uh, because uh, they found the bodies of the children afterwards. Some of them um, had signs of torture. Um, so it, uh, again, you know, the, the kind of the spontaneous reaction at that point um, was overwhelming and really led in part um, to the uprising that started um, in 2011 uh, and, and kind of spread the agenda, the opposition agenda spread. You know, they wanted the Assad regime to go. They wanted the Alawites to go. They wanted political reforms, et cetera, et cetera, all of which, of course, were totally unacceptable to the regime um, and frankly couldn't, uh, you know, no one could really force the regime uh, to implement them because it really controlled uh, the country so tight militarily and through these um, security, military security um, organizations um, that it had. And so by July 2011, uh, we're in, the, in a general civil war, you know, which uh, now is very, very slowly uh, starting to wind down after all the casualties and, and so on um, that I um, have talked about. Um, and perhaps not so surprisingly, you know, as the chaos um, and the political vacuum that emerges during the civil war um, starts to spread, there are groups that are trying to take advantage of what is happening. Uh, and the one group that was looking uh, for all these kinds of pockets where there was no real government power, Libya, for example, uh, you know, but also increasingly Syria, came into the country the radical Islamists, what we usually refer to um, as ISIS or Al-Qaeda or a combination um, of, of the both. Um, and they will become part and parcel um, of the civil war. And they will draw in, not so surprisingly, particularly the United States, because we are concerned. We're not concerned about Syria, necessarily. We're concerned about ISIS you know, and this kind of destabilization that these groups can bring um, to the region and beyond the region. Um, and so this is why um, ISIS becomes um, important here. Um, Again, a, a, a very, very dirty civil war, um, as you know. Um, they have used chemical weapons on a number of occasions um, against their own civilians, particularly against the Kurds as well, much like Saddam Hussein did uh, you know, previously. Um, and effectively, as I said, by the time we get to 2019 today, um, effectively, I would argue a stalemate um, for the conflict. Uh, and I'll show you in, in a little bit the kind of um, who owns what, so to speak, uh, at this point in, in Syria. Um, but there, there, you know, with very little, um, I will argue in a minute, kind of chances that this will ever really um, successfully uh, be resolved. And so here is what um, the country looks like today. If you can still remember that first map that I showed you, uh, as I said, the, the areas um, here um, um, are still uh, controlled, the Latakia area still controlled by, uh, you know, by, um, the, the, sorry, 
sorry, by um, uh, Assad um, um, and um, his group. Uh, but then most of it um, has actually been reconquered. Um, if you would have seen this map, let's say two, three years earlier, um, a lot of it would have been a lot more yellow rather than red because the opposition forces, uh, particularly the Kurds, um, at one point came almost up to Palmyra. Um, so, you know, it shifted kind of back and forth. But so this is kind of where it is today. Um, and, you know, as you can see, and particularly if you realize, you know, that the red represents the government forces, in, in other words, those supportive um, of the Assad regime, you can see why, you know, when I said, um, you know, that it looks that uh, if, if indeed uh, the civil war kind of peters out, so to speak, um, that the Assad regime very likely will remain uh, in power and re remain the dominant political force um, in the country because simply of the territory that they control. And this, of course, is a, is a, uh, a, a, a the, the yellow area where the Kurds are is a very much a problem. It's a problem not only because of the Kurds themselves, uh, but also because these Kurds are allied with their neighbor, Turkey. You know, and Turkey is very worried about what's going to happen. With the so I'm just telling you that because um, the, the, the next thing I'm going to tell you is, of course, that Syria is not just about a civil war. It's really also, it's a regional conflict. You know, it brings in partners, uh, uh, different countries uh, from the outside. I've just mentioned Turkey, for example. Uh, but I want to move forward um, a little bit, and I'll come back to this. And um, these are kind of what I see as the, you know, the background issues um, to the civil war. Uh, and uh, the whole point of this slide is that, you know, this is a conflict that, as I mentioned at the beginning, really goes back decades. This is nothing new. You know, a lot of resentments were built up, uh, the, the division of political offices, the domination of the economy by the Alawites, uh, you know, the torture that was taken place, the security state that was put in place, you know, all of these kind of very, very gradually build up. And of course, the catalyst, you know, was these 15 children. Uh, but all of this, uh, you know, all the background to this, you know, you can readily see, you know, goes much, much beyond 2011. Yes. Are you swayed at all by the, pers by the um, argument that, that the Civil War is the first of the climate change conflicts as a result of the of the young men move coming into the city from the farms because there was such drought and suggesting oh. that because that age group comes into the city has becomes displaced because they have no uh, no family no there, family so there they come under the under the uh, influence yeah, of Yeah, I must say I had not heard the argument uh, about, I, I mean, it, uh, to some extent, I think it makes sense. Uh, and and to the background here to the, to the question was that, you know, Syria went through a, a terrible drought uh, for about six years that indeed brought a lot of people into the con uh, from the countryside into the cities because there, there literally was nothing to eat um, in, in the countryside. Um, uh, now, the, the question, of course, uh, would be, you know, was this uh, because, you know, Syria from time to time has droughts. I mean, it's a cyclical issue. Uh, now, this one seemed to have been longer than normal. The issue, of course, is, is it another cyclical one, or, you know, a longer one, or is it indeed, you know, something related to global warming? I just don't know. I, I have a colleague at Dartmouth who could probably answer that question, but it's just beyond my competence. Yeah. All right, so um, let me kind of, you know, um, the, the final point here I wanted to make is, you know, the, for the background of the civil war um, is really what I call here also Syrians um, intellectualism. And that is that to go back to um, Arab nationalism and, you know, the power of ideas, um, that a lot of the ideas that were picked up, particularly by the younger generation, you know, as they move, as you said, into the cities, as you know, and, and as the civil war uh, takes place, you know, a lot of these ideas really resonate with these old ideas of Arab nationalism, you know, the ideas of uh, equality, uh, you know, egalitarianism, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we shouldn't forget, although, of course, a lot of them, unfortunately, have left, including some of the major poets of, of the country, um, that, you know, Syria really retains, uh, you know, a very strong intellectual core. Um, always has been kind of one of the countries, together with Egypt, uh, you know, one of these countries that uh, traditionally um, and, uh, created, grew intellectual, so to speak, um, in these countries. And certainly the University of Damascus and so on, prior to all of this, was seen you know, as one of kind of the high points um, in, in the Arab world. Um, so I, I just wanted to stress that uh, it's probably, you know, in, in part because I'm a professor, obviously, that I want to <laughs> convey to you that ideas are important uh, <laughs> once in a while. All right, so let me then very quickly bring in the region and, and the international. As I said, uh, you know, the, the war in, in Syria is not just a, a, a local conflict, an internal conflict. 
Um, it very quickly brought in, for some of the reasons that I've already hinted at, the, you know, the intrusion of ISIS, etc. It really brought in um, uh, the outside um, forces, particularly the United States um, and uh, Russia initially. Uh, but then, um, and I think I have a map, I'll, I'll show you the map in a minute, uh, just about every single country in the Arab region and beyond, uh, several countries beyond, um, were also drawn into the conflict. Turkey, obviously. But then, in part because, remember, the Alawites are Shi'is, uh, or they call themselves Shi'is at least, and the rest of the countries are Sunni. In a sense, what we see is just what we're seeing in Iran, what we're seeing in Yemen with the Houthis and so on. In a sense, this became a proxy war. Syria became a proxy war for the fighting between uh, those that defend Shi'is versus those that defend Sunnis in the Arab world. And so it's not so surprising, uh, you know, that um, the uh, that Iran weighs in with a certain group, you know, that uh, other countries, Turkey weighs in with a different group, et cetera, et cetera, because they all want to protect um, their interests in the country. Um, and so let me show you very quickly. I think I have a map here. Uh, now this is about. Let me uh, uh, just to, to kind of give you another kind of uh, impact of, of the war. The refugees. You've probably seen a lot of this on TV as well, CNN and so on. Once in a while, we'll do something on this. You know, the millions of, of Syrians that actually um, have been forced to flee uh, the country. And here is the map um, that um, I wanted to, uh, to, to get at to, to kind of give you an idea that this is no longer just, you know, a local internal conflict, but it's really one that is fueled, much like Libya is, much like Yemen is, that is fueled by regional actors and by international actors. And the countries in the green here um, are, are the countries um, that support um, the uh, Syrian opposition, uh, in other words, opposed to uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, and his clique. Um, and that, of course, includes the United States. It also includes, not so surprisingly, Saudi Arabia. They're Sunni, right? Uh, uh, and so, some of the other countries, Turkey, of course, as well, in part also because Turkey has its own problems, not only with the Turks, but also with ISIS um, and with some Shiite uh, groups. Uh, the blue ones, the blue countries are the ones um, that support um, the Syrian Ba'athist government. Remember Shiite, just so we see Iran, of course, is supporting um, them. And then the Soviet Union for a whole uh, other reason, in part because they've supported uh, the regime for so long and the regime was instrumental in them gaining access uh, to one, that one particular harbor um, in, in Syria. Yes? Egypt is not included. No, um, yeah, uh, and Egypt has, uh, yeah, I mean, Egypt has made a lot of really, t uh, really stupid mistakes since, uh, you know, Mubarak was let go. Uh, but the one thing that they've done is they've realized that for Egypt there is nothing to be gained by getting involved. They, you know, they're involved in, 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 in Libya, the neighbor here, for example, uh, but they, they deliberately have kept out of, uh, uh, out of uh, Syria. Uh, you know, they, they have enough on, on their plate to, to, really, to really worry about. And also, uh, for Egypt, uh, you know, Sunni versus Shia and so on is not a real salient political um, issue that you can sell. All right, and, and then, of course, there are some countries where there is division, and I'm not sure why they included this, uh, the only country where there seems to be division. Well, actually, it's interesting that they, uh, that they mention it because it's, it's of course, Yemen. Uh, and in Yemen, you have the Houthis versus uh, the government forces, and the government forces are Sunni, the Houthis are Shi. So, uh, again, actually, it makes sense uh, that Yemen would be, divided, you know, whatever Yemen still represents, it's almost as destroyed now as, as, as Syria is um, at this particular point in time. And then to kind of, uh, you know, kind of almost to conclude, uh, you know, because I've kind of mentioned so many things and I've shown you so many different slides and, you know, brought in so many variables uh, to kind of really confuse you at the very end uh, to kind of show you how all of this works together. This is a map, uh, you know, of all the different groups uh, and ISIS is at the middle of this map here for the time. But these are all the different groups and how they interact with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, red, all, the, the, the red lines or the, you know, the, the, the sides that attack each other the blue lines or those that are supporting. So this is kind of in a nutshell, you know, what, what the conflict in Syria is all about. And so, you know, once you see all this, once you see all these actors, again, <coughs> local, regional, international, um, let me then kind of come to my conclusion, uh, you know, to what Syria um, really um, represents. Uh, and that is, um, it truly is a conflict 
um, that um, has so many different dimensions to it. Uh, again, not just purely local, uh, but also within um, Syria, uh, many, many dimensions. It, it, it has to do with the economics, it has to do with uh, the privileges that um, the Alawites have enjoyed for so long uh, within um, Syria. It has to do with the Kurds, it has to do with the treatment of ethnic populations uh, within um, Syria. It has to do with the economic standing um, of individuals, the impoverishment of the majority um, of Syrians over the last 40, 50 years at the behest of the uh, government. Um, and in a sense, what I'm arguing here is that the underlying sources, the, the kind of the very basic issues that have driven uh, the, the war uh, in, in, in Syria uh, and that have driven the, the civil war in, after 2011 in particular have not in any way really been addressed. You know, the situation more or less remains the same. Yes, there's pre a little bit of pressure on the Assad regime, particularly when they use chemical weapons and so on. But the underlying structure of the country, the underlying power base um, of the country um, has not really changed. And as I said, if indeed my scenario is true that, uh, you know, the civil war would kind of, um, uh, you know, slowly, slowly end uh, and the Assad regime remains in power, uh, then you really have kind of, uh, you know, a deja vu um, all over again, which I think is what, what Syria um, is heading forward. The larger picture is, in a sense, and, and this is more speaking um, as a political scientist more than anything else, um, is that um, if you if you kind of, you know, and, and as Gloria said, I, I worked for the United Nations as we were getting into Libya and trying to, you know, bring some order to that country. Uh, and what you always do in those kinds of situations is initially look for kind of elements that you can pick up on or, or pick on, you know, that several groups share and that can kind of share, you know, begin as building blocks. Uh, you know, for an overall settlement. Um, and, and frankly, when I look at uh, Syria, um, I don't really see that at all. I don't see any single um, item that different groups in Syria can really uh, agree on at this particular point in time. Um, and so, you know, that makes a settlement um, extremely, extremely difficult uh, and, uh, you know, probably, uh, probably um, impossible. Uh, and so, as I said, there are really no incentives that anybody can govern, can give these different groups to really come um, to a, a conclusion. Um, and the, um, what I see as the future um, of Syria um, uh, is that it really may never again become the kind of effective consolidated, more or less consolidated state that it was uh, prior to 2011. And so we can, you know, think about all kinds of scenarios, you know, with the Kurds going their own way, for example, with the, the Sunnis creating a rump state, uh, you know, and, and, and the Alawites perhaps creating their own allied somehow with the Sunni state. There are all kinds of interesting uh, possibilities uh, for it. Uh, but the other thing that is possible um, is, and, and this is kind of a, a very traditional uh, Middle Eastern explanation, nation. It really comes um, out of uh, Morocco, uh, primarily. Um, and in Morocco, you may, for those of you who know a little bit about Morocco, traditionally in Morocco, um, he who was the sultan, the ruler, um, didn't really worry too much uh, about areas that were in dissonance, that you know, didn't agree with his policies. They, they distinguished very carefully between two areas, one area over which they wanted to have control, and then everything was, you know, didn't really matter. Uh, and, and then this distinction in, in areas uh, politics is called uh, the Blad al Mahsen. Blad al Mahsen is where the government controls um, area, uh, you know, is effectively in control. And then the Blad al Siba, um, which is the area of dissidents where the government, you know, may not have power, but it doesn't really care. And, you know, it's a very famous theory that was developed by Ibn Khaldun um, in, in, in Arab politics. And my impression is that this is where, um, you know, Syria may very well be heading. You know, that the government, that the, uh, those in charge, uh, may be willing uh, and, and very desperately may be willing to hold on to certain territories, you know, the ones that you saw on the map, uh, you know, that they now control, but that other parts, like the Kurdish part and so on, um, they will simply kind of slough off. Um, and so what that means is that you could have some kind of, at best, a kind of a confederated state where there is a, a, a national government, but where each region is autonomous. Uh, you know. uh, but that, even that is very, very optimistic. Uh, the, the more likely scenario is this kind of low-level civil war you know, that could literally go on um, for decades, um, essentially. Um, so that's kind of what I'm afraid of is, is the, uh, is the uh, 
uh, outcome um, of Syria. And as I said, it's a, it's a pretty pessimistic way um, of looking at you know, what has been one of the defining conflict of, the, uh, you know, of, of, of our last uh, couple of decades or so. Uh, but nevertheless, kind of looking um, at this country within the region you know, of, of which I'm a specialist, uh, you know, I would argue that the future for um, Syria, uh, unfortunately, does not um, look very rosy. So let me stop there and thank you all for listening. And I'll be glad to take questions. Please, yes. Could you explain the, the, the sentence, local wars no longer exist? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, I should have done that. Um, what, what I meant to say was that uh, essentially what I said, that you, 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 you can no longer think of conflicts that are taking place in the 21st century as purely internal conflicts. If you think of Syria, you know, where so many different powers, you know, all the Arab Gulf states, the, the Soviet Union, the United States, have an inter Turkey has an interest in, this is no longer about Syria. Right. This is, a, as I said, it's a proxy war. Well, think of all the other conflicts that we're having in the Middle East, for example. Think of Yemen. Yemen is no longer a, a Yemeni conflict. It's a conflict, again, of Iran as a Shiite state supporting the Houthis against Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, Russia and, and, and the United States kind of weigh in, you know, according to their own interests from time to time. So that's what I was trying to convey, that, you know, the, the way politics is going in the 21st century is that local conflicts don't really exist anymore. They, you know, they truly become almost automatically regional um, or global conflicts. Yeah. Please, yes. Yes. The United States war group, are they backing and why? They're, they're backing the opposition. Uh, but uh, and, and having said that, uh, and, and uh, yeah, sorry. Which opposition? Um, the uh, the opposition um, to the Bas uh, to uh, to uh, Bashar al-Assad. Um, but and, and and it's a very good question, and I was going to elaborate a little bit on it. It's it's first of all, it's hard to um, disentangle the opposition. First of all, because there are so many um, opposition movements have kind of portrayed to you the opposition as kind of a unified group, which which of course they're not. There's literally dozens and dozens of, of different groups um, in Syria in, in terms of opposition. Um, but so we have uh, periodically, uh, particularly when Assad, you know, bombs uh, some villages. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, chemical weapons and so on, you know, we'll, we'll get involved and, and then that lasts for a few weeks. Uh, let me be very clear, and, and one of my closest friends is the top person at the NSA dealing with this, we have no policy. We really don't have a, a consistent policy on, on Syria. We've just kind of been drifting back and forth depending on, uh, you know, what we think is, is in our interest. Um, so that's kind of, I think, where that stands. And, and sorry, what, what was the other part of the question? Why are the United States there? Oh, oh, yeah, why we're there? Um, well, I mean, we're there in, in part because, you, you know, this part of the Middle East, um, and uh, we just want to make sure that our allies, uh, the, the Saudis and so on, don't get too antagonized. I mean, uh, you know, we have lots of lots of different interests. Um, and so even though Syria may not be in our direct strategic interest, which it is not, in, in part it's cog of a much larger wheel, you know, of our interests um, in, in, in the region as a yes. whole. Um, uh, sorry, the question was, could you recommend a book that kind of lays out, uh, you know, kind of what I've covered today? Uh, and yes, I, I, there is one book I can recommend by the friend I just mentioned. Um, and what, what I'll do is I can pass it on to you or Liz or, or to Gloria, uh, you know, so the audience can get it. Um, and um, he's written a, a very, very good book um, on Syria. And, and again, uh, a very interesting left, even though I consider him probably the most, uh, the most, ex the, the, you know, the most informed expert um, on the region. He spent two years in, in the country just before 2011. Um, uh, his impact has been very, very limited so far. His name is Andrew, Andrew uh, Gabler, G-A-B-L-E-R. You'll probably, if, if, if you watch PBS uh, regularly, whenever they have Syria on, almost, Andrew is almost uh, on uh, every time. Yes, please. The question was, uh, could I comment uh, on kind of uh, Israeli involvement uh, and particularly, of course, the Israeli involvement against uh, Shiites um, and, and why, why, why that is happening? Uh, 
Um, and um, and I, I should have said there was, um, I didn't mention it because my talk would be too long, uh, but you know, the, the, the Syrians also tangled with Israel at one point during the 1973 war, et cetera, et cetera, but never really became a, a big issue. The, the Syrians deliberately kind of stayed away from the Israeli issue. What the Israelis are much more worried about, uh, you know, the big, the big 800 pound gorilla on the block, so to speak, for the Israelis is of course Iran. Uh, you know, which they see as a lethal threat. You know, the argument they make is that, uh, you know, Iran um, will, will eventually develop a nuclear weapon um, that, uh, you know, and uh, presumably uh, the Israelis say, you know, could be, our, could be used um, eventually um, against um, Israel. So that's in part why um, they have, you know, they have this very, very strong opposition um, to, um, uh, to the Iranian regime. Um, I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's much more to it um, than that. Uh, they, of course, are very worried um, that Iran is supporting Hezbollah, which is Shiite, uh, and Hezbollah is, of course, one of the major, uh, what the State Department labels, one of the major terrorist organizations that has been attacking um, Israel, and in a sense has become a dominant political, uh, a dominant military force in a sense, uh, particularly in Lebanon last now, in southern Lebanon. The, great, the, the next great war in the Middle East, I can assure you, will be between Israel um, and the Hezbollah militants, uh, you know, that are right across the border um, in Syria, uh, sorry, in, in Lebanon, uh, where they have fortified themselves, also including into Syria, um, fortified themselves. There's a, if you're interested in this, there's a, an, an absolutely marvelous article that was written um, for the New Yorker, I think it was, uh, about six months ago or so, where one a journalist actually went into the region um, and looked at the arsenal that Hezbollah has been able to uh, assemble over the last uh, couple of years or so, uh, which, uh, and, and remember that Israel went in at one point uh, uh, for two months in an invasion um, of uh, southern Lebanon to, to get Hezbollah out, uh, you know, which I think resulted in the death of 26 Israelis, if I remember at the time. Uh, what could happen now is, you know, that um, Hezbollah has literally tens of thousands of uh, these small missiles uh, stationed uh, on, the, on, the, on the on the northern part um, against the northern part um, of Israel. So that could be the next uh, the next uh, real war. And as you can see, you know, Israel has been very, very, very careful um, in responding to uh, anything that has to do with Hezbollah. Uh, you know, they make sure. You know, I mean, there's there's a strategy in international politics that you only retaliate as much as you need to because if you go beyond that uh, you know you, it's going to be a tit for tat so uh, the Israelis have been very very careful at, at watching this. Who wrote the article? I, I don't remember um, uh, but it was either in um, in the um, New Yorker or in the um, Atlantic. There is also somebody who's written quite extensively on this um, who's an Israeli journalist. His name is Neri Zil Zilber, Z-I-L-B-E-R, and he writes for a number of publications. He just published an article in Foreign Policy about a month ago or so. Neri is the first name, N-E-R-I. So you may want to take a look at that as well. Please, yes. Do you accept the view that Russia's involvement has been extremely strategic in the sense that one of their goals is to attack civilian populations and unleash uh, refugees into Western Europe, which seems to have led to the rise of far-right parties, far -right parties who are more friendly to Russia? Um, I personally wouldn't subscribe to it. I think it's too extreme, uh, you know, for what it, I mean, you know, that would, that would really, uh, if, if indeed, you know, there would ever be any evidence of that, uh, I think that could lead to a real major conflict, you know, with the European Union. Uh, I just, I mean, you know, Putin has done a number of questionable things, but to me personally, and that's just personally, it seems to go really beyond, uh, beyond the pale. I can't believe that, uh, you know, he, uh, I mean, that is really being devious, you know, almost beyond comprehension in a sense. So I, I would say no, but who knows? Uh, you know, you know, don't quote me, you know, maybe next, uh, next week there'll be an article <laughs> saying exactly that, right? Could, yes. Could I throw into yes, of course, yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> Russia, uh, um, the Soviet Union, and then followed by Russia, has been the traditional arms supplier uh, to Syria. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not surprising that Assad uh, 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 asked for Russian support once he's being confronted from the United States and the, and the other interests. So in fact, 
Uh, the price, of course, Putin being what he is, uh, charges a price, and the price he's, he's charged is a 50-year lease on the port of Tartus, uh, uh, on the western co coast, uh, uh, on the Mediterranean coast of uh, 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 Syria, and a 50-year lease uh, as on the airbase in Latakia. Uh, so, in fact, uh, this gives uh, Russia now uh, an access to the Mediterranean, uh, which, uh, of course, their Black Sea fleet, uh, based in, in Crimea, uh, now has an, uh, 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 an access uh, to the Mediterranean, which Russia never had before. And that's the kind of, uh, again, the uh, international complexity, uh, why big countries get involved in this thing uh, uh, in, in, in Syria. It's basically for their own reasons, not for the Syrian reasons. Actually, they've had uh, access to Tartus for a long time. This is not oh, yeah, nothing that's what new. I mean, but they've, had, yeah. they've, now, they've now, but they've never actually had. Uh, it's not ratified. There, there is not. There is not. Now there they have a 50-year lease. On no, them. no, they don't have a uh, lease. It's not ratified by the yeah. Syrians. Yeah. It doesn't need to be ratified by Putin. But no, 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 it doesn't need to be ratified by Putin, but it needs to be accepted by the Syrians uh, on, on their part. Uh, I mean, that, but you're right. I mean, uh, beyond that, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, the Russians for a very, very long time, as a matter of fact, as I said, the, the reason in the Cold War that they turned towards Syria was particularly to gain access to that harbor uh, and to Latakia and so on. Uh, th there's, there's very, very interesting things. I, uh, you know, it would take me all night to talk about that ha happening to the, the weapon systems in Syria. The Syrians are not happy at all with their Russian weapons, and they're trying to diversify. And, and so, anyway, it, it would get us far beyond uh, what we can talk about today. Yes, please. Here's an article in The Economist uh -huh. on, to, today on how well Putin has done in Syria. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. And it's a limiting factor is the Russians don't have the money to continue yeah, sure. to to support Assad, much less help him rebuild the place. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, which explains the kind of the traditional role that uh, uh, Russia, in a sense, has played. It's the role of spoiler. You know, if you don't have the resources to really affect things, you spoil things, essentially. Yeah. Please, yes. You mentioned China briefly. What about yes. their role? China has completely stayed out of uh, Syria. I mean, they have some investments and so on in Syria, but... Yeah, you had it on your map there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're, you know, they're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're no, there's no real military, uh, certainly no military involvement or anything. Um, China, uh, you know, as you know, is very, very strategic about its approach to the Middle East, has traditionally not had an entree at all into the Middle East, um, has been trying very, very um, assiduously to cultivate um, a very interesting thing uh, you may not be aware of. Uh, one, of one of the countries, of course, that uh, China has been trying to cultivate is uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, when when uh, Xi Jinping uh, came, no, his predecessor Jiang Zemin came to uh, Washington and get, didn't get an official red carpet treatment, he went straight from Washington to Riyadh. Right? Remember that? Remember that? Yeah. So anyway, so uh, you know they're trying to get into um, the the Middle East. Another very fascinating fact: Saudi Arabia, as of next year, uh, required language, second language in Saudi Arabia beside English, Mandarin. It's, on, it's part of their educational uh, curriculum now. So again, tells you how China is, 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 interested, is, is getting into the region. Yes, please. and sorry, not, not to even talk about all the, um, all the um, confusion institutes that they're creating all over the world. Gloria, do we have to finish or? OK, one more question, please. Well, where do you see the future of Kurdistan being part of Iran? Mm, yeah. A big player, Turkey a big player, that was left of Iraq and uh, Sure. Yeah, well, that is a really fascinating question. And, um, you know, I mean, for those of you who don't know the history, you know, the history of Kurdistan and the, 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 the idea of, of a unified Kurdistan as an independent state, you know, also goes back actually to the Paris Peace Conference and so on, where they had their representatives. Um, but, um, you know, so they're divided over five countries. No country has really given them um, uh, real political clout, so to speak. Uh, the Turks in particular have been very adamant that the political parties that the Kurds have um, represent terrorists and so on, the PPK, I mean, you know, a long thing. Here's the key, I think. The only, the only alliance that could really upset the apple cart, and the apple cart is essentially that things stay the way they are, um, is if there would be an alliance between the Turkish Kurds um, and those in Iraq. Um, 
And that is not an impossibility because the Kurds in Iraq um, are for all pur practical purposes, uh, and if I said this two years ago, it would have been 100% true, for all practical purposes independent. Chevron, uh, Exxon negotiates directly with the Kurds. They don't, they don't negotiate with the Iraqi government anymore, right? Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and that would have been the situation two years ago. But it has slightly changed. The Kurds in Iraq um, are coming to an agreement with the central government. So they may be taking out of that equation, you know, that possible collaboration that I just talked a minute ago. Um, so I think the most likely prospect is uh, an autonomous Kurdistan um, in Iraq, um, a kind of uh, lingering um, uncertainty about what's going to happen um, in, uh, in Turkey. Although my hunch is that, particularly as if Erdogan uh, goes uh, eventually, you know, that um, the whole Turkish issue may assume a lot more immediacy. And so they could probably also become an autonomous province or something within Turkey. Um, in Syria, uh, for all practical purposes, they are autonomous again, almost at this point. So we'll see these little pockets. If your question was, will they ever unify into a country, um, I think not. I think that's, that's just, uh, uh, just too difficult. Gloria? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure.